Ships at sea are at the mercy of nature. Every voyage, a sea-going adventure, the outcome of which is never known. What's the connection between sugar, the business acumen of a 19-year-old, post-war Japan, and shipping? India, a nation of deep cultural heritage, dates back to 3000 BC. In the Hindu Puranas, Varuna is the god of the oceans. His vehicle, a crocodile, and his weapon, a rope loop, which is the ally of any seafarer. The inhabitants of the Indus Valley civilization had maritime trade links with Mesopotamia. Mohenjo-daro and Harappa have revealed ample evidence that maritime trade existed. Lothal was one of the earliest cities in current Gujarat from where trade was done. Indian ships sailed to Egypt as the thriving maritime routes of southern Asia were not controlled by any single power. From time immemorial, men have conquered the roaring waters of the ocean and exploring the earth and laying new trade routes. The arrival of the British in the 16th century changed the trajectory and shifted the power to the British East India Company who needed to control the ports and the ships to control India. This allowed the British to use this powerful resource to push the industrialization of the West at the cost of the East, putting the Indian merchant marine on the back foot for the next few centuries. As India entered the 20th century, the movement for an independent India had taken root. It was in this environment that Valchand Hirachand and Narottam Murarji, both forward-thinking visionaries, started the Sindhya Steam Navigation Company by purchasing the hospital ship the Empress of India, renamed the SS Loyalty from the Maharaja of Gwalior. This, in 1919, was the start of the Indian Merchant Marine, when the SS Loyalty, which can be described as the first Swadeshi ship, made her first voyage. She sailed on the 5th of April from Alexandria Dock in Bombay with the odds loaded against her. Thus, the seeds were sown and the scene was set for the Indian Merchant Marine. The British government did not take kindly to such bold moves and created a strict guideline to limit the operation of the vessel to near coastal voyages and countries like Burma and Sri Lanka. Meanwhile, in the 1920s, Jagjeevan Ujamshi Mulji and company who were importing sugar from Java to India on their chartered steamers brought down the freight cost from Rs 27 a ton to Rs 10 a ton. Thus, the brothers Jagjeevan and Maniknal saw the potential and impact of shipping as a business. This was first blood. The business continued to grow until the 1930s, when the Great Depression hit and businesses suffered heavy losses. This quelled their business, but not their entrepreneurial spirit. They approached a wealthy business family in Bombay, the Bhivandiwalas, and won their confidence. They assured them that though they did not have the money, they had strong business skills and would multiply Bhivandiwala's investment. Thus began the partnership between the Bhivandiwalas and the brothers Maniklal and Jagjeevan, under the name Adarshi Hormasji Bhivandiwala and Company. The initials on the company flag. Initially, in the 1930s, the firm was engaged in the import of large quantities of sugar from Surabaya by chartering ships. This experience in chartering of ships made them the largest sugar importers and gave them appetite, experience and a deep understanding of the shipping business. There was a thirst to buy ships, but the world war broke out and the environment was no longer suitable for buying ships, and neither were the prices. Again, the powder was dry, the stage was set, the only missing piece being timing. In shipping, time is an ally. Waiting and patience is the name of the game. This patience finally paid off when the British, under pressure of the World War and the gaining momentum of the freedom movement, were forced to quit India in 1947. Now that the reins of the country were with leaders of a free India looking to grow and push the country to be an independent, self-sustaining economy, Swadeshi in every way, the time was ripe. Enter Vasant Shet, 19 at the time, who was sent to Britain and America for grooming in the business. During his travels, he met Mr. I.S. Chopra of the Indian Foreign Service and mentioned his plans to own and operate ships. Mr. Chopra took a shine to the boy and asked him to get in touch when in Washington. In Washington, Mr. Chopra put him in touch with the lawyer 
who suggested that Vatan Shet apply for the out-of-service Mothballed Liberty class ship Fort Ellis. These ships were built to haul supplies on the transatlantic voyage from America to Europe for the war effort. Now that the war had ended, these ships were being sold at throwaway prices by the US Maritime Commission. These vessels were built for one voyage only, at minimal cost and had no comforts since they were not likely to survive the German U-boat torpedoes. They were built with small engines and minimum machinery to keep the costs down but strong thick hulls to withstand the German firepower. They were the perfect workhorses, flexible for liner and bulk trades and continued operations till the 1970s, 30 years later. After getting clearance from Bombay, an application fee of $25,000 was paid and the application filed in the name of A.H. Bhivandiwala and Company. The result of the application would be known three months later. Vasan Shet came home and was busy in his trading activities when he received a telegram from the Ministry of External Affairs saying that the vessel had been released to A.H. Bhivandiwala and Company and the balance money had to be paid in three weeks' time. The delivery of the vessel was taken on 3rd May 1948, named the Jug Vijay. Jug, taken from Vasan Shet's father's name, Jagjeevan, meaning world, a prefix we maintain to date, and Vijay, meaning victory, thus translating to world victory. This kick-started the story of Great Eastern, brought together by India's independence, the end of the Second World War, and a cheap ship bought at the right time. This conflux of timing and quality assets have since been the trademark of Great Eastern. The first voyage with a cargo of coal was from Baltimore to Civitavecchia in Italy, followed by Aden in Yemen to Calcutta with a cargo of salt. From Calcutta, she loaded coal to Okha and then returned to her home port, Bombay. Once the vessel was in Bombay, after all the crew troubles, Indian crew was put on board and the foreign crew repatriated. Mr. H.T. Parekh, a close family friend and advisor, in his immense wisdom, advised the family to keep its interest in shipping and sugar separate. The end of the World War had reoriented many economies and the geopolitical ties between nations had changed. Japan in particular was hit especially hard and in 1951 was recently released from Allied occupation. This once proud nation had been brought to its knees after the atomic bombs and was struggling to revive its economy and industry. It was at this time that Great Eastern placed two orders with Mitsubishi Shipyard in Japan, becoming the first Indian company to place orders with a Japanese yard. This was the first project of K.M. Shet, a student then, who followed in the steps of his father and uncle. He stayed in Japan and visited the yard during the building of the two ships to be named the Jug Jamna and the Jug Ganga. Having put their faith in Japanese shipbuilders at a time crucial to rebuild their country's economy, Kameshet also forged a lasting relationship with Yamashita Steamship Company by getting the All India Agency for Great Eastern. Great Eastern also ordered two bulk vessels from Blom and Voss in Germany. These were the Jug Dev and the Jug Darshan. These revolutionary designs were adapted by the Hindustan shipyard in Vishakhapatnam to build four more vessels, Jagdish, Jagdharma, Jagdhir and Jagdut. The Jagdhir was eventually sold to the Tata Group. This was a design that the architect had been trying to sell all over the world but had no takers. This is Great Eastern's ability to find and recognize a good thing and bring it to its fruition. The 50s and 60s saw unrelenting demand for shipping, where shipping grew fivefold. The first trigger was the Korean War from 50 to 53, followed by the closure of the Suez Canal from October 56 to March 57. This forced all shipping traffic to go around Africa via the Cape of Good Hope instead of via the Suez Canal. This increased the voyage duration by 15 days, increasing the demand for ships and shipping in turn increasing the freight and in turn increasing earnings and profits. A major part of the ships passing through the canal are tankers carrying oil and oil products. This demand for tankers led to the first oil tanker Jug Jyoti being bought secondhand in 1956, being India's first oil tanker and a whole new avenue of business for Great Eastern. While closer to home, in 1962, the impact of the Indochina war could be felt with strict control on foreign exchange and public spending. India was striving to attain food security when agricultural production stagnated and then worsened by two consecutive droughts. On one hand, 
we were shortened foreign exchange and on the other hand we were paying commission in dollars to carry our own cargo KM Shet recommended to the Indian government that we as a nation should start our own chartering wing to provide the Indian public sector with the expertise to handle their own shipping activities this resulted in the formation of Transchart in 1964 to ensure the cargo support of the Indian flag vessels nationalizing India's chartering activity this highly cyclical business takes a certain type of businessman to succeed it requires a different approach and a stomach for a high risk game this is a volatile business susceptible to global events like the closure of the suez canal in 1967 which brought about the oil boom the yom kippur war in 1973 where we faced an oil embargo against the united states The Iran-Iraq war in 1979 followed by the Gulf War in 1990 and the invasion of Iraq by America in 2003 all causing an increase in tanker demand. If this wasn't enough to put a twist in the tail, in the early 90s the International Maritime Organization adopted a regulation mandating a new design for tankers, phasing out single hull ships to prevent pollution. If a single hull vessel touches the bottom, there is only one layer of steel between the oil and the sea. The new regulation required two As a result, ship owners started panic selling their vessels at discounted rates. Taking a contrarian view, Great Eastern believed that if managed well, these ships could run profitably. This period coincided with the end of the license permit raj, where government approvals were required for anything involving foreign exchange payment, be it dry docking or emergency repairs. Sensing this business opportunity, Great Eastern purchased several such vessels in quick succession. The end of the dreaded license permit raj gave fresh waves of liberalization, industry independence and ventures into more areas of business. One such instance is the voyage of the Jug Larki, which became the first Indian crude oil tanker to call America post the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. This was a new trade route for the company, bringing in fresh opportunities and new challenges. Down the line, as a part of the fleet renewal, Great Eastern built its own double hull tanker, the Jug Prakash in 2007. at the STX shipyards in South Korea. Great Eastern's foray into the offshore industry commenced in 1983 when it became India's first shipping company to invest in offshore support vessels. It was not until 2006 that it set up the Great Ship Group, its wholly owned subsidiary. When in 2004 the country struck gas on the east coast, it became a game changer and Great Ship began operations with the purchase of two mid-sized platform supply vessels. The Great Eastern Institute of Maritime Studies was set up to train the next generation of seafarers. Great Eastern further stepped into ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance initiatives. The Vasant J. Shet Memorial Foundation was set up in memory of Great Eastern's founder and is dedicated to promoting education, welfare, health and conservation. The Turtle Center in Rushikulia in Orissa is one such venture. The Great Eastern CSR Foundation was incorporated in 2015. The focus is on corporate social responsibility in three sectors: education, health, and livelihood development, aiming to uplift and empower the vulnerable, marginalized, and low-income population in India. <laughs>